most of us don't spend much time thinking about whether or not the Revolutionary War was biblical. You know, maybe, maybe that's not a common thought that comes to your mind, but good Christians actually do disagree on the topic. And the ones that think it was unbiblical, well, they would go to the text right here that we're going to look at, Romans 13, 1 through 8. So I wanted to compare and contrast. Listen to this from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as that to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now, Romans 13, starting in verse 1, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad, would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So, sounds a little bit different, the conception of governments. One, the authority and the declaration of independence of the government comes from the governed. In Romans 13, the authority comes ultimately because God has placed them in power. And... The Apostle Paul really doesn't seem, in this passage at least, place any obvious qualifications on the authority of the government. God instituted, and if you resist it, then you're resisting God. It makes you wonder if King George might have sent this along to the Continental Congress. And, and even that whole Boston Tea Party thing is looking pretty bad. You pay taxes if, you're owed, if you owe them to somebody. Now, the wise among us might retort that there does seem to be a bargain or, or a duty that the government is supposed to fulfill in this passage. Punish evil and reward good. So we don't owe any allegiance to tyrants. Problem solved, right? Well, maybe think about Paul's context, who he was writing to and who was the ruler at that time. The people who, some of the Caesars who were ruling when Paul was alive, Maybe you've heard of them, Caligula and Nero, not exactly paragons of virtue. And people who, when we think about tyrants in history, they rank up there among the worst. So are we back to square one? Are there, is the government just unlimited power? And I think there's some obvious exceptions when we look at other examples in scripture. So what do you do, for instance, when the government commands you to do something that God has forbidden or forbid, forbids you to do something that God has commanded? How are we supposed to respond in that sort of situation? And we can probably think of some biblical instances. For instance, think about the midwives in Exodus commanded to kill the Hebrew babies, and yet they refused. And when asked about it, they lied about the reasons. The, the women were just given birth too quick. So they disobeyed a direct command of the government, and they lied about it. But it says that God dealt well with the midwives. Apparently what they did was something pleasing to God, and intuitively we can understand why. Or you could think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refused to bow down and accept the consequences. Being commanded to do something that God forbids, obviously there's some exception there. But what about when we're forbid to do the things that God commands us? Think about the apostles in the book of Acts who were forbidden to preach the gospel. They refused. They said, we must obey God rather than man. Or Daniel, uh, another case in point. The law is made that no one can pray to anyone except the king. And in Daniel, we, we read, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem. He got out, down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before he 
his God as he had done previously. Now, let's be clear here. There is no command that Daniel had to pray in the way he went about praying. That is, he didn't have to have the windows open towards Jerusalem, get down on his knees to make it really obvious what he was doing. And he didn't have to do it three times. Daniel's not a Muslim. He has no prescribed number of prayers he has to do. And yet, when he knew the law was signed, he did this, and we can kind of think, of, think about this as him thumbing his nose at the edict and at the law, deliberately disobeying, knowing the consequences that await, waited for him. And so that, that we can understand. You know, if God for, if God, if the government forbids us to do something God commanded or commands us to do something God forbid, then we disobey. We have clear examples from Scripture, and there are others. But what about situations beyond that? Because there are all sorts of things that you and I are called to do in Scripture, called to endure sufferings and justices. Uh, when, when we get slapped on the cheek, we, we turn and give them the other one. We're called to endure injustices as individuals. But what happens when it's the government delivering a slap to the little old lady down the street? Because it's the government, are they just allowed to do it? Are they allowed to commit injustices? And how does that work out, work itself out and deal with the second greatest commandment, that we are to love our neighbor as ourself? Is it loving to my neighbor to allow them to be subject to injustices. If we saw someone being attacked by a criminal gang in the streets, we would justly defend them. We might use violence if necessary. What happens if it's the government doing it? And how do we respond then? It seems that there's situations where these things aren't quite so clear cut. And we, we have to tread carefully here, though. Because every situation is not as clear cut as the Hebrew midwives. We're not all being called to throw Hebrew babies into the river, but there are certainly situations where we could imagine the government commanding us or forbidding us to do the things that God wants us to do and not live in the way that God calls us to live. But most of us don't live in those ways most of the time. And so we return to the natural way that Christians are to interact with the government. That there is a hierarchy that God has placed the government over top of us and we are to submit to them insofar as we are able to, while still obeying God. We are to obey the laws, pay the taxes, honor the office and the one who holds it. But there's also a message here to the Caesar in Paul's letter, and that it is God who is over the government and over above the government, and his law ultimately trumps every law of man. And he expects the government to punish evil and to war reward good, and that when government oversteps that bounds, we know that God raises up and he brings down governments. So we submit ourselves insofar as we can while still obeying and honoring God because that is what God has called us to do, meaning we don't skirt the lines of what is gray and what is legal. And we remember first and foremost that we are citizens of heaven and we live here as strangers and exiles. But like the exiles of Israel and Babylon, we seek the welfare of wherever God has placed us by submitting ourselves to, to those in whom God has placed over us.